board members, I call this pre-meeting of the Carrollton Farmers Franchise the Board of Trustees to order at 6 p.m. on March 7th, 2019. Item number two is briefing session with administrative staff regarding the posted agenda for the regular board meeting scheduled for 7 p.m. on March 7th, 2019. Are there any questions or items that board members would like to discuss? Tara? Uh, no questions, but I just want to let um, you know that I would like to pull item 4D from the consent agenda because I'd like to recuse myself from voting on Ranch View High School and Landry Elementary contracts, and I'd like those to be a separate vote. Okay. Ms. Derrick? I'd like to go ahead and also at the same time for 4D pull Vivian Field and Newman Smith. Board members, anybody else have any uh, items on the consent? So I was going to ask a question of staff on one of the consent agenda or two of them. Um, I was, Dr. Chapman, I had a little confusion. I wondered if you could explain in English H and I, and um, <laughs> or in something simpler. Um, sure. And so if, if Ms. Webb, if you don't mind kind of addressing H and I, and then Talk a little bit about what's the difference of our action item for D. Yes, sir. Just the difference. Be happy to. Um, item H is a maintenance agreement for our Cisco equipment. It's for them to provide repairs and updates, security patches, those sorts of things. So it's just a maintenance agreement. It's software? Software. Okay. Yes. And then um, I is the professional services to install the network equipment, which is the action item later in the agenda. Oh, okay. We separate those out because some companies are awesome at installing the equipment. Others are very good at getting good pricing. And so we always bid it out as two separate entities. One company might win both, but oftentimes it's different companies getting the professional services versus the equipment. That's very helpful, and I appreciate the explanation. I meant to send it as an email, and I forgot. Okay. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Board members, was that clear to everybody else beforehand, or just not me? No, never mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so with that, um, <laughs> reports by administration. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Warnock, she's going to present the second half of uh, our accountability system that we weren't able to, to get to last month. And so we're going to carry that pathway on. And so at this time, Dr. Warnock, would you present domains one and two? Is that something we might have here? No. Okay. No, 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 no. I have put the map uh, data here that we're going to um, look at this and would be happy to send you a copy or, or share these slides. Um, just to give some overview and context, this shows the largest 200 districts in Texas. And if you look at our x-axis, that's our percent of economically disadvantaged in the schools. And then if you look at our y-axis, that is the accountability rating or score. And so uh, the red dot there is CFB, so that shows us um, that about 65% poverty where we're performing that green line is the line of best fit and that's the predicted performance based on the numbers of students in poverty that you serve and so we see that we're above uh, that line significantly mm -hmm. we want to be at that top blue dot so we look at those blue dots that are above us in that same band of, of poverty you know between 60 and 70% and what's really interesting is that those are all small rural districts and have a lot less economic and um, ethnic diversity than CFB does. Those districts are like Waller ISD or um, Valley View ISD, um, mostly 4,000 to 5,000 student school districts that are situated not really in an urban setting and context. So just taking that into account, it's something that we feel you know, really proud of. We're by far the largest school district in that band of poverty um, that's you know, moving there. Our goal is this year to 
be in that green band. So to move into the 90 range. And um, we've already looked at our graduation rate and our college and career and military readiness factors from last year. And we have increases in both of those areas in last year, which is included in this year's accountability. So really the pieces that we're waiting to see uh, where we'll be is just our star test. And that composes our domains one and two, which I'm gonna talk to you about tonight. So any questions about this? So those districts with 4,000 or 5,000 kids are part of the 200 largest districts they in are. Texas? They are. That, so, I mean, that's pretty amazing to think we have 1,100 school districts and 900 of them have less than 4,000 kids in them, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Gary. Which one, that one that's in the 90th percentile that's in the green? That's Valley View ISD. It's a I-35. You no, know, that's a different no, Valley View. Different this Valley is view. the Valley View in the Valley. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. So, that. Valley View up I-35 is not performing as well as okay. Valley View in the Valley. So, yeah. All right. Um, Mr. Shackman? If, oh, so sorry. if I'm reading this correctly, this is a, should be something we want to be touting in the community because I'm not doing the math, but if you look at the blue and green to the right of the 60% uh, economically disadvantaged, we're one of about 25 districts in the whole state. Correct. Okay. And if you look at, um, if you look also at our financial efficiency with our academic right. performance, where uh, there are only five districts with 25,000 or more students in Texas that are performing at that level, and we're one of those five. So, I mean, it's just something really that is, yeah. it's a great celebration. Yeah. So, Good. yeah. Um, so we have the three domains. Last time we talked about domain three, which is our um, closing achievement gaps. But tonight we're just gonna talk a little bit about domain one and two. And the way that the accountability system works is that domain three counts as 30%. There's no uh, ifs, ands, or buts about domain three. But 70%, the state has given, and this is where we really do think there's some fairness in this part of the accountability system, that that 70% on student achievement, you can either earn for your absolute achievement or you can earn based on how much growth students are getting. So we might um, have kids that start off lower performing, they're not hitting the absolute achievement mark, but if we're showing growth year over year, whichever is the best of those two domains can count for our 70%. So domain one is the student achievement domain. And for our elementary schools, all that counts in this as 70% of their academic rating is how they perform on grades three through five on the STAR test. That's all that's included, 100%. And for middle school, it is grades six through eight, and then any students that are taking an algebra, or in our case, we have students who also take the biology EOC at Perry Middle School. So those are included in the middle school calculation. And then for our high school, this is a little bit different, and for the district. So the high school carries a significant chunk of the district's accountability. 40% of it is based on the EOC, those five tests that they take. 40% is based on how many students are getting a career, college-ready, or military-ready um, distinction. And then 20% is based on our graduation rate. And that's for the high schools and the district. So the way it works is kind of, I've been explaining to principals, you know, think of it as points. Every time a kid takes a test, they can earn three points for the district. If they get approaches grade level, they earn one point. If they get a meets grade level, they earn two points. And if they get a master's grade level, they earn three points. So the way this works, if this was a, a sample campus, 83% of the students got approaches grade level, 65% got at meets grade level and 26% hit master's grade level. That's 174 divided by three. It's a 58 is the domain score. That would be a high B. So schools have to be at a 60 or higher to get an A. So we're sitting down with each of the principals and looking at where were you last year and then what would it take in your growth and approaches, meets, and masters in order to get to the 60, or for some schools to get to, you know, a B. So that's what we're looking at with achievement. 
Any questions about that? Then comes the CCMR part, and that's for the district and for the campuses. And so this is where we're looking at, did students meet their TSI criteria in reading and math? And they can do that by taking the SAT or the ACCUPLACER and meeting certain criteria or the ACT. And so offering school day SAT this year, offering the ACCUPLACER, and we're doing really intentional preparation for that. And that's meant to remove that barrier of college testing as entrance exams when kids go on to college. Then they could meet a criteria on any AP or IB exam, so earning a three on an AP or a four on an IB test, uh, earning nine hours in dual credit, or three hours in language arts and mathematics. And our expansion of UT on-ramps this year is meant to help serve uh, meeting this criteria. Uh, earning an industry-based certification, and we continue to review how we expand uh, that. Earning an associate's degree while in high school, uh, graduating with an IEP or workforce readiness, so that is a, a vehicle for our students who uh, are served through special education, enlisting in the armed forces, um, or uh, having a CTE coursework, they can earn half a point if they have aligned CTE coursework. That's only for this year. Next year, that won't be an option. Um, then next, we look at our graduation rate, and so for this domain, they look at the four-year, five-year, and six-year graduation rate, and whichever was your highest is put into a scale and computed, and then that gives you a score. So typically for us, it's our six-year graduation rate that's the highest. We have students, uh, uh, a lot of our English language learners or students at Mary Grimes that might take a little bit longer to meet the high school graduation requirements, um, but uh, any of those three will count here in domain one. So this is a copy of the worksheet we gave you at the January board meeting. Um, and this is what we're kind of workshopping out with principals to, to calculate where they, their steps are and then working to drill down into our data systems to identify where students move next. The second domain is the student progress. And there's two ways that you can earn this. So it's either through academic growth basically looking at how many students only in reading and math grew at least five percent from one year to the next year or relative performance so it goes into a calculator they look at what was the performance of the campus what's the poverty of the campus and they give a score then whichever of those two is higher counts as your domain two score then whichever is higher of domain two or domain one counts as your overall uh, achievement or progress so students here earn different points based on if they are growing. If a student moves from does not meet to approaches, um, they can earn a point or a half a point. Basically, the idea is that every student needs to be moving, gaining over the prior year. And so we're being very strategic about data talks with students and setting targets so that each student is shooting for at least a 5% growth or staying at masters. So, you know, if we have kids who scored 98% on the test, they just have to stay in that master's range in order to move uh, forward as getting a growth measure. Then part B, relative performance. Again, they look at the performance, put it into a calculator with the school's poverty and the district's poverty, and see if, if the students are performing higher than expected based on the poverty at the campus. And there's some lookup tables. Of course, it's complicated and complex. Again, we're using this as a worksheet to calculate out the number of students, the number of growth points that are available. And in order to get an A, you have to demonstrate 82% of your kids are making growth in reading and math, and the same uh, middle and high school is at 80%. So um, we're looking at where did we fall short there and how do we move that forward. And we use these resources from Lead Forward to help principals identify what those target ranges are. The last piece of data that we're using to look at growth that really helps us, and we put a copy of this here for you, and I just wanted to walk you through um, a little bit, is our map data. So this is measures of academic progress. Um, and this is a test that's given in many districts across the nation. And what's really great about this is it helps us see that growth year over year. So I'm just going to walk you across the top line 
of the data that you have in front of you here. So this year we have 1,803 kindergartners who took MAP test in the fall and their mean RIT was 139.1. That was their score. And it's a nationally normed test. We were at the 49th percentile, so just right at right below the average of the nation of where kindergartners were scoring. So our kids weren't coming in substantially lower than the rest of the nation or substantially higher. Then if we look at the winter, we see that their mean RIT went to 151.6, and we really look at that percentile, we are at the 55th percentile. So our students in kindergarten from the time we tested in the fall, which was in early September, to when we tested this winter, which was in February, have moved from the 49th to the 55th percentile in mathematics. Then we look at over here the school norms. You see the projected growth was 11.6. So they take a look at where kids perform, and as kids test and map, if the questions are getting too hard and they start missing a bunch, then it lowers the level for that child and then it sets a projected growth target for each time they take the test. So as an average in CFB, we were projected to grow 11.6 points, but it, we grew 15.4 points in kindergarten. So we exceeded what our expected growth was as an average. So if you look there, we're at the 72nd percentile in terms of growth for students when you compare nationally. If you look over, we had 1,803 students test under that student norms. 1,017 met their projected growth. That doesn't mean the others didn't grow. They just might not have hit that 11 points that they were projected to grow. Maybe they had 10 points of growth or nine points of growth. So then we were 56% of our kiddos met their projection. And we look across the nation. We, mostly you know 50 to 60 percent if we're in that range we feel like we're we're really doing a good job of making progress so this helps us look and see where we have dips and then we have this for every single campus every single child and we're walking through and looking at that data to see what are our next steps um, so we provided that with math and reading here for you. The beauty of this, and I just pulled up Cadence here because, you know, whatever, I can share my own child's data with you. I wouldn't share any other child's here in the public meeting. But what happens is, and I masked all of the other kids, just I hid them, but I could click on this report as a teacher. So I went into his teacher's classroom. <coughs> And as the teacher, I get these bands that show me and they place the child where the child is in each of these bands. So for Caden, I could see here that he is comparing and contrasting claims and multiple argumentative texts. Uh, he can do this author's, author's craft. That next band below, moving into assertions and claims, is where the teacher would need to take him next to move his growth. So the teacher gets that for every single child, where they are, how they're performing independently, and then what their next target is and the skills that they cannot yet do independently. So we're working and our data and assessment team is doing a fabulous job this year. We're really excited about that team out communicating with campuses and training teachers on how to better use this data to be in the moment with kids to move each of them forward. So that's a quick overview of domain one and two and how we're looking at growth. Questions? Because that was a lot. Yes, Sally. So a quick question about uh, the MAP testing. Are we doing that at every campus? Every campus, are, okay. yes. Um, at, a, at 10th grade, we're only giving it at 10th grade at one uh, high school for English language learners. So that's why there's only 11 children uh, there on the 10th grade because we're, we're looking to track that uh, one class's growth. But The test shifts, I mean, there's a couple of different things that we think about. Uh, the test shifts at second grade, it shifts again at sixth grade, becomes more complex. Um, it's also only given in English. 
Next year, the test will be given in Spanish. The norms are being developed this year, and we are participating in that. But when we look at our literacy and consider that over 30% of our students are English learners, mostly concentrated in elementary, that's something that we have dialogue about the, the gains in reading. And if we're below our projection, uh, the test is administered in English, even for our students who receive instruction in Spanish. Any other questions? Wait time. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> thank you. Next, I just wanted to address with you, and, and, you, and you have a copy in front of you over the summary of uh, House Bill 3. This is new that came out uh, yesterday, and this kind of gives you some information about what does this look like in the future. And so whenever I was meeting with uh, Julie Johnson and Michelle Bakley yesterday, we were walking through what would this do for CFB, and I'm not going to touch on every one of these. I also sent it to you electronically, but you know what would that do for our numbers in the event that this were to pass? First of all, the House is offering or, or putting on the table nine billion dollars, and so as you know, the House and Senate don't always see eye to eye, so so know that. But when we were running our numbers, you now it, it was very promising, and when they ran it the first time and the second. Um, they looked at two things, and the two key components that I, that I thought was incredible was the fact that we're going to get about anywhere from $650 to $700 more per child. So that's about $15 million to CFB. But even one of the more important things, too, was the recapture. As you know, we're get, we're, we, we had to send back $30 million. With this new piece, as you can see, it would be $2 million. And so that, that's, that's huge as we move forward. And there are some other components about, you know, getting a full-time ADA for our pre-K kiddos. There's also the piece in there that, that the state would get 400, or we would get as a state, $400 million for full K pre-K. That stage one would be $1.9 million for CFB. And then that all ties into kids reading on level at third grade. And so then there's components that would list from that that we could get up to almost five million dollars over the course of five years and so that would be tremendous for cfb as we're going to push and start having this conversation about offering free pre-k for all students i think that's a that's a that's a huge piece we'll see where it goes but this bill just came out we'll see where the senate comes in and let me even back up further as you know on the senate side they they move the bill forward to give all teachers five thousand dollars all teachers then they came back with an amendment and said all right we're going to give an extra 53 million dollars and we'll include librarians well that's great but what about counselors diags nurses all of the other folks that fall in that grade and then you get into ap's when you move one you've got a whole bunch of other folks you have to deal with so they did tie in on the senate side 53 million for librarians in that piece on the house side they're giving us a lump sum of money and we're allowed to do with as we see fit on the local level. So that's huge. And so I don't want to touch on everyone, but, and you can read at it and you can ask me questions uh, later and I can provide you that information. But again, this is just skimming off the top. It will change, it will change, and it will change. But, it, but at least it's a start, at least the House and Senate both are having conversations right now that we do need uh, new money. You know, the goal back, I'm going to go back as far as September. The conversation was if we could just get about four to five billion new dollars for public ed, we'd be in great shape. So when the house comes out with nine billion, that's a home run. So if we can get half that, home run. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see where we go. But the house is, is uh, I appreciate what they're doing, what this looks like, and how we're moving this forward in the course of, we'll see, next two months. But I just wanted to at least, at least let you have this in your hand today. And I'll continue to send you information and updates. If you ever have questions through that, respond. I've been answering your questions as fast as I can to get that to you. Don't hesitate to ask. And as, as we move forward, you know, what we're talking to, especially Julie is very open and honest and, and, and we're walking through. She's hearing our concerns. She actually... She's one of the, what I can say I'm very impressed with, is she actually calls me on the floor, which is what my past legislator did, but she's literally <coughs> calling my cell phone going, how do I, what do I do, what do you think, what does this look like, which is very impressive. 
and Beckley and her and her staffer Matt also calls and, and we're working through some things. But it's it's great that they want to know what we think, and that's that's not always um, that doesn't always happen in in, in, in the legislation times. So so that's good, and, and I appreciate them for that. Can you kind of explain the copper penny? Yeah, not even yes. Not. <laughs> I'm just. It may. No, I'm no. not going okay. to. I was just wondering. Because whenever we walk through a couple components of that, so I started asking about. All right, let's talk about the compressed rate. What about the extra uh, 13 pennies above the 104, and what would that look like? Yeah. And then what about the local control? And I'm like, well, we'll get back to you on that. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think we're even going to talk that through. But and that is some tax relief for the taxpayers. But then that. the local, yeah, so the local district would then have the authority. You know, you, you remember the, the three golden pennies? Yes. Very same concept. That's why I wonder what happened, because they still say golden penny. They do. But now they have copper pennies. Yeah. Well, just so you don't get confused from those four pennies they're back when we titanium were at Dollar. Or, no. Um, no, they're copper this copper time. This stuff. <laughs> but it's the same concept. Platinum but, pennies. Yeah. <laughs> but there's still some gray in there. So if we did compress the rate again, where are those 13 pennies when we jumped jump? moved up to a dollar 17 so it's one thing i think that was introduced in the past was the ability to let a district kind of flex what they're charging mm -hmm. the taxpayers mm -hmm. and it was always refused to give that flexibility right of um if there is a year when it's found that it doesn't need to be as great mm -hmm. do you see any signs of maybe that ever coming well, back well yeah is that that was actually one of the first bills that representative Johnson filed right to give us that flexibility okay but I, but both parties are not going to see it that way. Okay. They're not. Board members, any questions? And once this starts to really ramp up, it was, it was somewhat of a slow start. But once this starts to ramp up, there'll be more validity to how these bills are going to move out, what they're going to look like, and then see how both parties can come together. I'll really start sending you quite a bit of information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So with that, board members, it looks like we're at the end of our agenda, and we will be adjourned at 6.27 p.m. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Does anybody know what next week is? <laughs> <laughs> so just curious. <laughs> Making sure. Um, thank you. Welcome to our March 7th board meeting. I call this regular meeting of the Carrollton Farms Franchise, the Board of Trustees, to order at 7.02 p.m. on March 7, 2019. Board members, district staff members, and members of the audience, you are free to join me in standing as Susan Rogers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints provides a message followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Candace Valenzuela and the Pledge to the Texas Flag led by Guillermo Ramos. Please, please join me in a bowed head. Our dearest Father in heaven, how grateful we are for this night and this opportunity to be together. We're grateful for this forum and this opportunity to listen to one another, to discuss the needs of our students and um, our school district. We're so grateful for the roles that we have as teachers, parents, administrators, community leaders to instruct and uplift the students within our reach. We're grateful for the accomplishments of our schools and our students collectively and individually. We pray, Father, at this time for the individuals. We pray that thou would bless those who uh, may have specific or individual needs, that we may be able to be aware of those and reach out to them and meet those needs, whether they be a language learner, someone experiencing homelessness, someone suffering with mental health issues or physical health issues. We pray for those students with special needs and for anyone feeling lonely um, or otherwise vulnerable. We pray that that would help us to see the individual and their needs, to meet those needs, as well as helping our students in general to rise. These things we pray humbly, asking thy blessings upon us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag 
of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. As a district, we dedicate all our efforts and resources to our goal of high achievement for each student. The board uses this goal to guide all deliberations, decisions, and actions. You will get to see all deliberations, decisions, and actions of the board in open session, with the exception of some items which may be discussed in a closed session, as stipulated in the Texas Government Code, Section 551, commonly known as the Open Meetings Law. These items typically deal with personnel matters, consultation with our attorney, and real estate. For the record, the board members present are Ms. Herbacek, Mr. Matthews, Ms. Derrick, Mr. Shackman, Mr. Ramos, and Ms. Valenzuela. And um, we constitute a quorum and may conduct business on behalf of the district. Ladies and gentlemen, before moving on to the next agenda item, I'd like to remind you that the board encourages comments from citizens of the district and from district employees. Anyone wishing to speak, either as an individual or as a representative of a group, may do so during upcoming agenda item number three, audience for guests. If you have an audience for guest requests, you can fill out the form provided on the table just outside the north entrance of the boardroom. And you may place the completed form either in the box provided on the same table or present your completed form to administrative assistant, Ms. Kim Castanon. Where did Kim? She's over here at this table in the black. Um, when the board addresses agenda item number three, audience for guests, you will be invited to the podium to speak to the board. So now, Dr. Chapman, we are on item number two, special presentations and recognitions. Yes, thank you. At this time, we're going to have uh, Ranch View Principal, Sherry Scrutch, give us an overview of the All-State Choir, and then she's going to start the presentations. So good evening, Dr. Chapman, members of the board. My name is Sherry Scrutch, and I have the privilege of serving as the principal at Ranch View High School. Tonight, I'd like to introduce our students who earned a place in the Texas Music Educators Association All-State Choir. All-State is the highest honor a Texas music student can receive. Students are selected through a competitive process with three rounds of auditions that begin with over 70,000 students from across the state vying for the honor to perform in one of these elite organ uh, ensembles. Only 400 students have been selected from across the state to participate in choir. All state students are the top 1% of all Texas high school musicians. Ranch View High School was fortunate to have four qualifiers this year. Lindsay Darvin is our first uh, all state student. Congratulations, Lindsay. Go ahead. Lindsay is the daughter of William Darvin and is currently a junior at Ranch View High School. After graduation, Lindsay plans on attending a four-year university but is undecided as to which one at this time. Her goal is to become a pediatric glaucoma specialist. Our second All-State student is Michael Harris. Michael is a junior at Ranch View and is the son of Mike and Christine Harris. Michael's plan after graduation is to study opera performance. He is undecided as to which school, but is considering Oklahoma University, AMDA in New York, and Juilliard. Congratulations, Michael. Our third All-State uh, Choir member is Desmond Henderson. Desmond is a senior this year and is the son of Penny and Wesley Henderson. Desmond plans on attending Howard University next year where he, where he will study music education. Congratulations, Desmond. Our fourth All-State student is Haley Lennon. <laughs> Haley 
Haley is a junior at Ranch View and is the daughter of Elizabeth Wilson. After graduation, she plans on attending Saxon University in the Netherlands to, pre to become a physical therapist. Congratulations, Haley. I would like to say congratulations to all of our Allstate students on this great accomplishment. I would also like to say thank you to Laura Roberts and Matthew Favalinia, their teachers, for your guidance, support, and encouragement to them throughout this process. Go Wolves. Hello, my name is Michael Arriola, and it's my honor to serve as the principal of Newman Smith High School and to recognize Aiden Black as our all-state choir performer. <laughs> Aiden is the daughter of Les and Emily Black and will be attending SMU next year and major in vocal performance and music education. Her goal is to become a high school choir teacher. And we would also like to recognize Mr. Lucero, Ms. Pose, and Ms. Suarez, who were her choir directors, and all of the Fine Arts Department at Newman Smith High School. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, members of the board. My name is Joe LaPuma, and I have the honor to be the principal at Creekview High School. Please uh, help me in congratulating Mr. Jacob Jeter as he has earned all state honors in the 5A treble bass choir. Jacob Jeter. <laughs> Jacob is the son of Olga and James Jeter and they're here tonight with their, with their other son, Christopher. Jacob is a Rosemead and Blaylack graduate and currently finishing out his junior year at Creekview High School as one of our very top scholars. His plans for after graduation are to attend Baylor, study biology, and then go on to medical school. Jacob is also in, one of, is also in our top orchestra who received straight ones yesterday in the UIL Region 31 competition. What an, honor, what an honor it was to hear Jacob and the All-State Treble Bass Choir perform in San Antonio last month, and I would recommend this choral experience to all. I would also like to recognize Jacob's uh, choral director, Mrs. Kelly Pfaffenberger, who I saw somewhere, Kelly, and Mariah Spirey, who is not here. Jacob, thank you again for being an outstanding Mustang, and congratulations on earning All-State in Choir. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, Mrs. Klein, and members of the board. It is my pleasure this evening to celebrate some amazing and hardworking CFB business education students who are involved in DECA. DECA Incorporated began in 1946 as the Distributive Education Clubs of America. Over the past 70 years, their scope has continued to broaden, and today they have 215,000 high school members in 3,500 high schools in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Canada, China, Germany, Guam, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Spain. DECA's mission is to prepare emerging leaders and entrepreneurs in marketing, finance, hospitality, and management in high schools and colleges around the globe. Through both their classroom curriculum and industry-validated competitive events, DECA prepares students to be academically prepared, community-oriented, professionally responsible, and experienced leaders. 
Students in these competitive events must not only participate in a written component, such as a report or an exam, but there is also an interactive component, perhaps a presentation of a business plan, with an industry professional serving as the judge. The students are gaining valuable writing and presentation skills that will serve them in high school and beyond. Additionally, DECA awards over $300,000 annually in scholarships to its members through their corporate sponsorships. And in CFB, DECA is alive and well. Recently, our DECA teams from Creekview and RL Turner High Schools competed in the state competition in Fort Worth. It is my pleasure to introduce our Turner DECA students who will compete at the DECA International Career Development Conference in Orlando, Florida at the end of April. They are Christian Fields, son of James and Nympha Fields. <laughs> Belen Gonzalez, daughter of Trinidad Zermeno and Raul Gonzalez. And Daniela Rubio, daughter of Beatriz Marquez and sister of Jose Alvarado, a Turner grad class of 2017 and also a DECA member. When these young entrepreneurs compete next month, Christian, Belen, and Daniela will present their business growth plan for their snow cone stand, Icepocalypse. <laughs> these young entrepreneurs started their business last summer in Lake Dallas. A family friend secured a small business loan for them, and by the end of the summer, they paid the full loan back. Icepocalypse will be open for business again this summer, but the real work for them will begin when they graduate in 2020. Yes, they are just juniors. Their business growth plan explains how they plan to grow their summertime only business into a year round venture with the tagline, keeping you cool when it's hot and warm when it's not. Their plan includes specialty hot chocolates and expansion into a mobile setup that will allow them to operate at local community events throughout the year. This kind of hands-on, real-world business experience is what DECA is all about. And we're proud of these Turner Lions, and we wish them good luck as they compete in Florida next month. We know they will represent the pride well. Good evening once again. Uh, what a great honor it is uh, for me to be here tonight and to be able to recognize these two outstanding Creekview students and the other uh, outstanding students from the other high schools. The, the student that I'm going to recognize from DECA, he's a DECA national qualifier. His name is Mr. Ali Kabani. <laughs> Ali is a senior at Creekview High School and is the, and is the son of Golzar and Amin Kabani. Ali came to us from North Hills Preparatory Elementary School, Blaylack Middle School, and now Creekview High School. Ali is also an Eagle Scout, a Law Academy student, and a top scholar at Creekview, currently taking three AP classes. Ali was also a member of our basketball team for the past four years. With the last two years, he was playing on the varsity, and yes, a very nice three-point shot. Ali has already been accepted to the University of Texas, where he plans to study government and then possibly attend law school after. At the state DECA competition held in Dallas two weeks ago, Ali competed against 74 other students in the personal financial literacy event. Ali received first place and er earned his way to the national competition in Orlando later in April. Um, I would, all, before I forget, I would like to recognize Mr. Peter Cott, Ms. Lori Wood, Ms. Christina Thompson, three of our Creekview CTE teachers. <laughs> 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 
who get to work with these outstanding students like Ali Kabani. Please help me once again in congratulating Ali. Good evening, Dr. Chapman and members of the board. Uh, my name is Charday Dockery, and I have the privilege of serving as the principal at Dan F. Long Middle School. Tonight, we honor Jeff Foy as Dan F. Long's Teacher of the Nine Weeks. So Coach Foy, who actually is here from a track meet and will go back to the district track meet after this, <laughs> that's dedication. Um, Coach Foy has been teaching for 13 years and five years at Long Middle School where he is our, one of our athletic coaches and our positive attitudes for success teacher. Uh, Coach Foy has a strong presence on our campus because of his meaningful relationships with students. His role as a coach and mentor has completely changed the lives and narratives of our students at Long. He is able to reach and teach to the heart of the most, of the most challenging student, literally. Uh, congratulations, Coach Foy. We are glad you chose CFB and Long as your home and family. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and members of the board. My name is Jose Ramos. I am the proud principal of Blair Elementary, home of the Mighty Eagles. It is with great pleasure that I am here tonight to present Blair's teacher of the third nine weeks to Ms. Roxana Hernandez. It is no surprise that Roxana is sitting here or standing here this evening because what singles her out above all else is her strong sense of purpose as a teacher, a purpose that is on display every day at Blair. Her diligent work ethic, her content area expertise as a self-contained teacher, her willingness to help her peers, her understanding that she is always in process in developing her craft, and her dedication to her students exemplifies many of the qualities of a master teacher. It is hard to believe that she has only been teaching for four years. A quick story that encompasses her greatness. We have a student this year that unfortunately missed uh, two years of school and came to us as a frightened little boy that could not read a single word. Over the past six months, due to Roxana's passion and skill set, this child is now reading on grade level. That's eight reading levels. She She has been able to close almost two years of academic gaps in the span of less than one school year. This is quite a feat in education. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez, for just being you. We are blessed to have you as a member of the Blair family. Good evening. I'm here tonight representing Eva Medina Walker, who unfortunately is ill and wasn't able to come. But it's my real honor to introduce you to Ms. Claudia Noriega, second grade bilingual teacher and Blanton's teacher of the nine weeks. <laughs> 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 
Tonight I want to share with you not how Ms. Noriega is a very hardworking teacher who dedicates her time and energy to help her students learn, not about how she inspires students to do their best, and not about how she holds them accountable and supports their efforts. Instead, I want to talk about Claudia's love and caring for the well-being of her students. It all starts with all of her students being called her babies. Not because she doesn't believe in them, but because she takes care of them as her very own. She nurtures and celebrates their successes and keeps track of their achievements years after they've left her classroom. Their success stories span 22 years, which is how long she's been working in our district. Claudia's caring for students knows no bounds. When there was a need for extra funds to pay for fifth grade t-shirts that students could afford, Claudia stepped in. When a coach was needed and a supervisor for the Olympiad, Claudia stepped up. When an angel tree was needed for the holidays, Claudia pitched in. One of her students went through a very serious illness and the monthly treatment suppressed her appetite. Claudia took action and started sharing her snacks. She discovered that apples and baby carrots were well liked, so Claudia packed those for a daily snack. Claudia is a planner, so before the holidays, she made sure to go shopping and sent a variety of snacks for when her student would not be at school. As you can see, Claudia has a heart of gold and a profound desire to help her babies succeed in life. Her dedication, love of her students, and generosity make Claudia a worthy of the title of Teacher of the Nine Weeks. Good evening, Dr. Chapman and members of the board. My name is Monica Cohen, and I am the proud principal of Carrollton Elementary. Tonight, it is an honor to recognize Marcy Howe as our teacher of the nine weeks. <laughs> Marcy is a strong pre-K teacher. There is no doubt about that. It is evident in the amount of students and parents who praise her teaching on a regular basis. But when I think of Marcy Howe, the word advocate and ambassador comes to my mind. Ms. Howe has been an ambassador for Carrollton Elementary and CFB since before our district even had ambassadors. Oh boy. <laughs> she believes in CFB and she believes in the staff and students of Carrollton Elementary. Marcy demonstrates that education is not a one-size-fits-all arena. <laughs> Every year she brings a different group of students <laughs> and they come with varying needs. She, Marcy shows and displays a true passion of culturally responsive teaching. She believes it is so important to give all students a safe environment in which to learn without negating their own backgrounds, cultures, and identities. Not only is she a great teacher and advocate, but she's also pretty good at loving on our staff. In the limited spare time she has from teaching, tutoring our fifth grade students on Friday nights, and working after the bell, she is devising ways to increase staff morale. From monthly games in the lounge to random notes in our mailboxes, she is trusted and respected on our campus because she is an advocate for fairness, respect, and kindness. She is a perfect example of what excellence looks like. Ms. Howe, thank you. Thank you for believing in and being an advocate for all students and for trusting in our district and our school. Thank you for taking the time to help others see the excellence of CFB and of Carrollton Elementary. Thank you for loving on our staff when the work is hard. I'm honored to work alongside you. We are honored to have you as part of our staff. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and board members. My name is Luz Soto Dimas, and I have the honor of being the principal at Central Elementary. Tonight, we are here to honor Erica Ortiz as our teacher of the third nine weeks. <laughs> Erica has taught a total of 11 years, six of which have been in CFB and at Central as a pre-K teacher. 
Erica leads our Central Sunshine Committee. She is the GT coordinator and team contact for her team. She takes on everything with a positive attitude and is always looking out for bonding opportunities for our central staff. Her colleagues share, if I ever need anything, she's the one person I can go to. Erica builds strong relationships with her students. As a pre-K teacher, she wholeheartedly believes students learn through hands-on experiences. She provides and creates amazing opportunities for her students on a daily basis. From making volcanoes to voting on their favorite cookie, learn, cookies, learning in Ms. Martinez's, sorry, Ms. Ortiz's classroom is fascinating. Central is fortunate to have Erica Ortiz as a Central Cub team member. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and Board of Trustees. My name is Kim Chow Jackson, and I have the pleasure of being the principal at Country Place Elementary. It is my honor tonight to recognize our teacher of the third nine weeks, Leanne Starnes. <laughs> Leanne is CFB. She is in her 22nd year of teaching and all at Country Place. She's taught various grades, most recently fourth grade, and for the first time this year, kindergarten. Even though she is new to having little people all over her all day long, she will stop to help you at any time. The kids love Miss Starnes. Anytime I've walked into her class, students are singing, dancing, reading, or doing calendar math. She makes learning fun and engaging. I am new to Country Place this year, but it did not take long for me to see why Ms. Starnes is so loved and cherished by the staff. She's always willing to help and does so with a positive attitude and a smile. I said that um, the Starnes family is also a CFB family. We have her husband, Chad, who's also a coach at Perry, who's also here from the track meet. He will be going back to the track meet, by the way. Um, both of her daughters um, attend CFB schools, Mallory at Perry and Madison at Smith. Um, and so we know that her family, as well as her Country Place family, are very proud of her. Leanne, thank you for all you do for our Country Place family. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Chapman. I'm Lisa Williams, principal at Davis Elementary. We're here tonight to honor Mrs. Susan Cox. <laughs> Officially, Susan serves as our librarian, but that is just the beginning of her role at Davis. All staff and students rely on Susan Teachers comment that she never ceases to have a smile on her face, goes above and beyond for the students, and is the most positive person at the school. She's very helpful, resourceful, and always has a positive attitude and spin on any situation. Susan can turn anyone's bad day into a great one. Literacy instruction anchored with depth and complexity thinking skills is evident and visible in the library daily. Regardless of the actual weather, sun shines at Davis as Susan leads the committee with fun ideas for the staff. She's in charge of the technology team and her makerspace is highly sought after, along with her kind, caring spirit that lifts each and every person with whom she interacts every day. Susan is always available to help everyone with a joyful heart and calm demeanor. Students agree that Mrs. Cox settles our glitter and helps us self-regulate our emotions. She throws great parties for us and teaches us how to love reading and how to think deeply about books. I love reading so much more because of Mrs. Cox. I put myself into the book and live the life of the characters. Thank you, Susan, for bringing joy, thought, and fun to Davis Elementary.
Good evening, President Klein, Dr. Chapman, and members of the board. My name is Susan Machayo, and I have the honor of serving as the principal at Farmers Branch Elementary. Tonight, we are here to honor Sabrina Garza as our teacher of the third nine weeks. This is Sabrina's 14th year serving the students of FBE as our fifth grade math instructor. Sabrina is a CFB product, having attended McLaughlin Elementary, Vivian Field Middle School, and graduating from Arl Turner High School. Sabrina understands the impact that focused teaching has on student achievement. I remember in one of my first meetings 13 years ago with Sabrina that she had already begun analyzing her students' math data in order to identify their strengths and areas for growth, even before the first day of school. However, Sabrina does not see her students as star scores. She cares about the whole child, not only their math data. When we have our Mustang homecoming and our graduating seniors return to FBE to reminisce about their elementary days, they always ask me, is Ms. Garza still here? Teenagers don't ask about teachers seven years later unless that teacher made a significant impact on them, and Ms. Garza does just that. This is one of the many reasons why FBE is truly blessed to have Sabrina Garza as part of our family. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and members of the board. I'm Robin Campbell, Principal at Freeman Elementary. It is my honor to recognize Kristen Imlet as our teacher of the third nine weeks. <laughs> this year, all educators in CFB were challenged to be the exception. Dr. Chapman, without hesitation, I can say that Kristen Imlet is an exception to the norm. Let me highlight just some of the many reasons her peers chose to recognize her. Kristen serves as a team leader for the fifth grade team. She leads our student council group after school on Mondays. She greets all students daily at morning arrival. She organizes our campus science fair event. She coaches our campus STEM team, and she actively participates in our district network instructional rounds team. On top of this, Kristen truly believes in supporting and growing others by opening her classroom doors to multiple student teachers and visitors from around the district. Kristen Imlet has an exceptional attitude towards education. When others view obstacles as barriers, Ms. Imlet is the exception. She sees them as opportunities to grow. Thank you, Kristen, for modeling for all of us at Freeman how to be exceptional. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and members of the board. My name is Lori Parker, and I have the privilege of serving as the principal of Furneaux Elementary. The staff at Furneaux is proud to recognize Teresa Sieber as our teacher of the third nine weeks. Mrs. Sieber began her career in CFB as a volunteer at Rosemead Elementary. She then joined the Furneaux family 21 years ago as a content mastery aide and the next year as the content mastery resource teacher, which now we call Fundamentals and Learning Lab. For her program, Teresa serves as a mentor, a leader, a point of contact, and a quality control type role to test out what is working and not working in the program, not only for our campus, but the district as well. Stephanie Flores shared that, so it's not just me determining if you're the quality control person. <laughs> Teresa, who is counting down to opening day so she can watch her Chicago Cubs, is married to her husband of 37 years, Ray. All three of their children are CFB graduates, two from Smith and one from Creekview. Teresa and Ray have seven grandchildren, three attend Central Elementary, and she is proud to say she can name all of them. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa, for your dedication to your students and believing they all can achieve, for all you do for the staff, students, and parents at Furneaux, for volunteering your husband for every school event, 
being my forever editor-in-chief and introducing me to Garrett's Popcorn. Thank you, Teresa. We love you. Good evening, Ms. Klein, Dr. Chapman, and members of the board. Please join me in welcoming our fourth grade teacher and fashion extraordinaire, Jazz Torres, as our third nine weeks Teacher of the Year from Good Elementary. The Gators showed up. In the classic cartoon, Winnie the Pooh, Piglet said to Pooh, there is freedom waiting for you in the breezes of the sky. Pooh replied, but what if I fall? And Piglet responded, oh darling, but what if you fly? I thought it'd be appropriate to begin with this quote, Ms. Torres, because you not only encourage our students to fly, but you give them the confidence to soar. You are the daughter of immigrant parents who raised you to pursue the American dream. And not only did you achieve the American dream, you also inspired your students to follow their own dreams each day. When I asked one of your students to write me a note about you, not only did she write me a note, she wrote an entire poem. Carrie, just like you, is the daughter of immigrant parents and an immigrant herself. And she looks up to you as many of your students do. Here are a couple of stanzas from her poem. It was written in Spanish, so this is the best translation. <laughs> Those memories engraved in our minds from, our, from your class will always be in my heart. You have taught me with love. When the sun rises, I am ready to learn. And you wait for me with enthusiasm, even though the afternoon has come. Ms. Torres, thank you for always inspiring our students to follow their dreams and for teaching our kids to never let anyone dull their sparkle. Dr. Chapman, members of the board, my name is Debbie Williams, principal at Kent Elementary. It is my honor tonight to introduce Faith Yee as Kent Elementary's Teacher of the Nine Weeks. <laughs> Faith's team has a go-to phrase, WWFYD, or what would Faith Yee do? do? Faith's selflessness puts others first. She has an innate sense of how to reach each child to help them grow both academically and emotionally. Faith can be seen attending her students' sporting events and other activities outside the school day. This is just another way she connects and nurtures each child. It goes without saying, Faith is a fantastic team member. Faith attended Kent, Blaylack, and Creekview, and she's student taught at Kent and so a product of CFB. Faith ensures that students at Kent Elementary get the same exemplary education that facilitated her success. We love you, Kent, oh, Kent. We love you, Faith, and we're proud of you. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Chapman. Vivian Field unanimously selected Carol Hames as our teacher of the nine weeks. <laughs> K 
Carol is an eighth grade science teacher at Vivian Field. She is our very own Bill Nye, the science gal. She started as a McLaughlin Strickland Tiger, then she came to Vivian Field, and she, uh, where she was a mighty Viking, and then went on to be a member of the R.L. Turner Lion Pride. Her 13-year career in education was preceded as a social worker, which no one is surprised by this, because Carol's loving and caring heart spends many, many hours at Vivian Field. Carol, uh, Vivian Field is a place where Carol lives out her Christian faith and her love for her Vivian Field students and science. She started as a top performing reading teacher begging to go to the science department and where now uh, Carol is living out her hardest science experiment yet. If you were to come to Vivian Field, not only uh, would you see Carol standing her post in e-hall telling the students that she loves them and to uh, make sure that their idea is out and visible um, but you would see that she is a part of our campus culture and everything we do she embodies congratulations miss haim and we can't wait to your back at vivian field standing your e-hall post District announcements, Ms. Brown? Good evening, everyone. I want to remind the audience that March 11th through the 15th is spring break. Are we all excited? <laughs> all campuses and district offices will be closed. Enjoy your time off. The countdown to pre-K welcome night for all students that will be entering pre-K is April the 1st at 6.30 p.m. at all of our pre-K campuses. Our countdown to Kinder Welcome Night is April the 23rd at 6.30 p.m. at all of our elementary campuses. Check our website for more details. Thank you to everyone that came out to Casey's Run in the cold last Saturday. It was a great day. Our Special Olympics track and field meet is March the 28th at Standard Stadium. We wish all of our athletes competing the best of luck. I would like to invite Dr. Richard Rivera. Is Dr. Rivera here? I didn't see him yet. He was supposed to be, okay, I'll move on, I apologize. He was going to be here. Um, I would like to invite the council PTA to give an update on PTA. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, Ms. Klein, and members of the board. My name is Meredith Watson, and I serve as the Council PTA President for CFB. And I'm going to give you a quick update as to the efforts of Council PTA over the past month. I'd like to congratulate Creekview High School PTSA for winning the Texas PTA Welcome Back Membership Award. They submitted 10 new PTA memberships in January, which is kind of difficult to do because most people actually join in August. If you haven't joined your local PTA, please do so now. Uh, Council PTA recognized our Reflections winners in January, and we sent 21 of those entries on to Texas PTA. Texas PTA has been announcing a few categories at a time, which will move on to National PTA. So far, we've gotten results back from three of the six categories, and I'd like to congratulate Micah Patterson from Creekview High School. His dance entry entitled Letting Go won the overall Award of Excellence and will now be moving on to the National P PTA Reflections Contest. The remaining of the Texas PTA results are expected to be announced any day, and we are so proud of the artistic talents of our CFB students and want to thank all those that participated. As part of our Healthy Lifestyles Initiative, Council PTA is organizing a district-wide walkathon on April 3rd as part of the Move More campaign in April. Each school, district in the, each school in the district is encouraged to walk for 15 minutes to highlight the importance of healthy habits among our students. And the last parent education presentation this year will be on March 27th from 6.30 to 7.30 in the ESDC building, and we'll be covering current drug trends. Child care will be provided for children ages three and up, and the presentation will be in both English and Spanish. If you cannot make it in person, please be sure to check out our Facebook live stream, and we look forward to continuing our partnership with the district and organizing our parent education events. 
Uh, we invite you to join us for our upcoming PTA Life Member Awards Ceremony and Council PTA meeting on April 25th at 6.30 p.m. In per at Perry Middle School. Uh, we get to honor all of those receiving the Texas PTA Life Member Award as well as hold our Council PTA elections and everyone is invited and hope to see you there. Um, and lastly, just remember to engage with your local PTAs on Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms. Um, it's really neat for me to see all the engagement that happens throughout all of our social media, and I find out a lot about our district that way. And so keep doing that. It's awesome. And um, thank you again for your continued support of PTA. That concludes our announcements. <coughs> Ms. Brown. Can you tell us briefly what the May 3rd talent competition is about? Or? Yes, so the Educational Foundation will be hosting um, a CFB's Got Talent. And so we invite all of our high school, middle school and high school students to um, try out, um, to apply and audition and then try out. And then on May the 3rd at Ranchu High School, we will um, be hosting the first ever CFB's Got Talent. You don't want the teachers to participate? You know, um, like not this year, it's students. Okay, not this year? Okay. Sixth Just through checking. 12th grade students. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're excited about it. It'll be a fun um, evening. We're going to have um, a lot of fun. So Ranchu High School, May the 3rd. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the PTA for their support of our school district. I'd like to recognize the students that were here tonight. We're very proud of y'all. Um, seniors, we look forward to seeing what all you achieve when you leave after graduation. Juniors, we hope you come back and we see you again next year. Um, <clears throat> Staff and principals, thank you for bringing your teachers of the nine weeks and telling us about them, making one of them cry. But it's really what we're all here for, <laughs> is to see the passion and the love. You know, we don't need to ever settle our glitter, do we, y'all? No, nah, we're all good. But um, settle your glitter, the fights we all have and, and the challenges in life, but thank you for that y'all are here helping us raise the kids that are gonna go out in the community and serve for the future. So thank you for bringing them. I hope you have fun celebrating. If you have a minute, when we take a break in a minute, come look at some of the great photo um, artwork that we have up front. Dr. Chapman, anything else? Are we no, good? Yeah, we're good. So now we'll take a brief recess. It is, oh, it's telling me how many steps I have. That's not very good. 7.52. Um, <laughs> we'll be back at 8.02. This meeting of the Carrollton Farms Branch ISD Board of Trustees is called back to order at 8.04 p.m. There's plenty of room at the front. I know those of y'all that were concerned about finding a place to sit. And the air is cooler up front than in the back. Whoever was complaining in the bathroom about being hot. So um, please join us at the front. No, just, okay. So um, Ms. Castellan, are there any audience for guests this evening? So we will move on past agenda item three to agenda item four, consent agenda. The consent agenda is a mechanism that the board uses to approve a number of routine items together with a single vote. In compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the public notice for this meeting includes a list of all consent agenda items and the board has been provided ample information about these items in advance. Prior to any action taken on the consent agenda, board members may request withdrawal of individual items for clarification or discussion. Board members, are there any items to be removed from the consent agenda at this time? Ms. Herbacek. Uh, I'd like to remove item 4D, consider the approval administrator contracts to be considered separately. Okay. Um, so we have the consent agenda minus Item 4D. Hi. I move that we approve the uh, consent agenda as amended. So we have a motion by Ms. Valenzuela, a second by Mr. Shackman. All those in favor? That is unanimous. So, so our next item is item number five, non-action items for discussion and consideration. Report on the 2018 Texas Academic Performance Reports. Dr. Chapman. Yes, ma'am. At this time, we're going to we're going to provide the Board of Trustees a report on the Texas Academic Performance Reports. 
Dr. Parker or, or Dr. Warnock? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to welcome uh, Dr. Parker, who is our uh, Director for Assessment and Accountability. And we really want to recognize Dr. Parker and her team who are here um, tonight for their outstanding work and service uh, to our principals and to the district. So thank you, Dr. Parker. Thank you so much. Um, good evening. Tonight we're going to be sharing information related to the district's annual report and an update on the state's accountability system. The Texas Education Code requires that each district's board of trustees publish an annual report that includes the Texas Academic Performance Report, also known as TAPER. And in addition, tonight's public hearing is held to discuss items found within the annual report. This includes information on the district's accreditation status, their accountability ratings, as well as a report on the items listed here. Each year, the Commissioner of Education assigns districts two ratings within the state accountability system, one on public school finance, known as FIRST, and another based on academic performance reporting indicators. Last year, Carrollton Farmers Branch earned a financial rating of an A and an academic rating of a B. Our district was also assigned an accreditation status, which met all standards required for public schools as determined by the Commissioner. One of the major changes in the state accountability system last year was the introduction of the A through F rating system. In previous years, districts and campuses earned a rating of either met standard or improvement required based on criteria that was established within a four indices system. But for the 2017-18 school year, districts received a rating of an A, B, C, D, or F for overall performance, as well as performance in three separate domains. Subsequently, a direct comparison between years is, is not currently possible. Based on House Bill 22, academic performance under the A through F rating system is defined as the following. These labels apply not only to the overall rating earned, but for each of the domain scores as well. To briefly review, the A through F system is comprised of three domains. 70% of the district's overall score is based on either student achievement performance or school progress measures. The highest scores is used in calculations. The remaining 30% is based on performance in closing the gap indicators. For high schools and the district, the overall domain one score for student achievement includes star test results, college, career, military readiness factors, and graduation rates. However, the domain one score for elementary and middle schools is comprised solely on star student performance. School progress, domain two, includes how much improvement students make from one year to the next on star test, or how well they perform in relation to comparable campuses based on socioeconomic status. Only the highest score in domain two is used when calculating the overall A through F rating. Lastly, domain three. Closing the gaps looks at how well students, excuse me, how well schools educate children in up to 14 different student groups. Information reported within domain three fulfills the federal accountability requirements prescribed under the Every Student Succeeds Act, also known as ESSA. In 2018, our district earned an overall numeric score of an 87 and a letter grade of a B for academic performance reports. All 36 campuses within CFB earned a rating of MET standard. And this year, in August, our campuses will also begin receiving an A through F performance rating. CFB earned a B in each of the three domains. For student achievement, the score was an 84. Student progress, school progress, an 86, and closing the gaps, an 89. Distinction designations are a recognition of outstanding achievement in academic performance. In total, our campuses earned 90 distinctions. These are awarded to schools in the top quartile of their designated comparison group of like campuses. With regard to overall student performance, there are four star performance standards. Did not meet grade level, approaches grade level, 
meets grade level and masters grade level. The approaches grade level standard is the state satisfactory requirement for star grades three through eight test and end of course exams. The meets grade level standard is aligned to college readiness defined as students having a 60% likelihood of success in their first year of college with their C or better GPA or grade point average. These performance standards are aligned to the state's 60 by 30 plan, which is to have 60% of individuals ages 25 through 34 with an industry certificate or a post-secondary degree by 2030. The Student Success Initiative, also known as SSI, helps schools take a closer look at student performance in reading and math. Students in fifth and eighth grade have two opportunities to retest. And based on star performances during the spring administration of 2018, our fifth and eighth graders improved in every administration and was competitive with the region and the state performance rates. Students taking an end of course test have three opportunities to reassess. Last year, our greatest gains occurred in English one and English 2 during the test given in December and also again in English 2 during the spring administration. <laughs> Turning our attention to graduation rates, as shown on the 10-year trend line, CFB has seen tremendous growth since 2008 when the graduation rate was 82.5 percent. With 1,597 graduates, the class of 2017 made history by attaining the highest graduation rate known at this time for our district, which was 95.2% for four-year graduation rates. Now, graduation rates, they are reported twice in the A through F rating system. With regard to state accountability measures, the five-year graduation rate for students from the class of 2016 was included in domain one. However, the four-year graduation rate from the class of 2017 was used in Domain 3, closing the gap calculations to fulfill that federal accountability requirement. Next, one of the newest additions to the state accountability rating system is college career and military readiness component. Methods to demonstrate college career military readiness, or CCMR, includes courseware coursework taken by graduating seniors while they're enrolled in high school, such as dual credit, AP, IB, career technical education, and college prep. It also includes college ready factors, such as test scores on the TSI Accuplacer, SAT, and ACT. Career and military ready graduates are those who earn an industry-based certification or associate's degree, graduate with IEP workforce readiness, or enlist in U.S. Armed Forces. Students from the class of 2017 outperformed both the state and the region in terms of overall CCMR and the percent of students graduating as college ready. Highlighting for a moment college readiness, these charts show specifically where the class of 2017 outpaced the state in AP, IB, as well as performance on both the SAT and ACT during this accountability reporting period. Now tracking student performance well before graduation is another component within this year's accountability system that is driven by the 60 by 30 Texas plan. Outcome measures included are the percent of students meeting grade level standards in math and reading as early as grade three. Grade eight star performance as well as CCMR graduates plus college enrollment and completion rates are included within post-secondary readiness. In addition to tracking how many students enroll in college after high school, the Higher Education Coordinating Board measures student performance in terms of grade point averages earned by students during the year immediately following high school graduation. Post-secondary enrollment is reported only for students attending a public four-year university or a two-year college within Texas. Enrollment is also attributed to where they earn the most semester credit hours between the fall semester of 2016 and summer 2017. 
post-secondary completion rates is based on the percent of students earning a college degree or industry certificate within six years of high school graduation. Across Texas, 25% of the class of 2011 received college credential within six years. The completion rate for CFB graduates from the same cohort was higher at 31%. The district's annual report also includes information on student discipline. CFB takes school sa safety seriously. The student uh, code of contact, uh, conduct strictly adheres to the Texas Education Code, Chapter 37, and is updated annually to reflect changes from the legislature, legal precedents, and input from a district committee. Safety and crisis trainings is provided to all district staff and students on a yearly basis. Video surveillance is operated on the interiors and exteriors of every CFB facility. The 2017 Texas Academic Performance Report was released by TEA on December, two, December 21st, 2018. While TAPER is accessible in both PDF format and online from their website, website links to these reports for our district and campuses have also been included on our website as well as within the district um, annual report. On a final note, it's important to reiterate the information reported within a TAPER contributing to our A through F rating spans multiple school years. STAR data and demographics is based on students in CFB during the 2017-18 school year. Our financial rating and CCMR factors are from the 2016-17 school year, while post-secondary enrollment is based on the graduating class of 2016. This concludes our presentation on the district's annual report for 2017 and 18. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Board members, are there any questions? So our next item on tonight's agenda is 5B public hearing on the 2018 Texas Academic Performance Reports. Ladies and gentlemen, I call this public hearing about the 2018 Texas Academic Performance Reports to order at 8.19 p.m. The board now will hear comments from the audience. Please indicate your intent to speak by raising your hand. If there are no speakers, it appears there are no speakers. This public hearing about the 2018 Texas Academic Performance Reports is closed at 8.19 p.m. So that brings us to item number six, items for discussion and or action. Um, we pulled item 4D, so 6A is items removed from consent. 4D was removed from consent. Ms. Herbacek? Um, yeah, I'd like to have some of the administrator uh, contracts uh, separated. I'd like to recuse myself from voting on the Ranch View High School contracts and the Landry Elementary contracts. Okay. Ms. Barrett? I would like to request that I recuse myself from the Newman Smith contract and Vivian Field contract, please. Mr. Ramos? And I would do the same, recuse myself from the Newman Smith and Vivian Field. So. Board members, um, how about we start with looking for a motion to approve 4D minus the Ranch View and Landry items. Ms. Derrick? I make a motion that we approve the administrator contracts minus, oh, I need to, yeah, yours. I need to do minus, Just Newman, I need to do two. mine though, minus Newman Smith and Vivian Field. I went backwards. Okay. So we have a motion by Ms. Derrick to approve the- Oh, no, 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 sorry. I need to, I need to, I need to fix Please. that. Yeah. Do you want to do them all together though? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I would do two. Do all except the four. Got it. And then do the four and one then do at the a time. Seven. We're making this complicated, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm gonna make a motion that we approve the administrator contracts minus- I would um, just do minus Ranch Field. Smith Field. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. For the first. Okay. 
Yes. So approve the administrator contracts minus Landry, Ranchview, Newman Smith, and Vivian Field. Cool. That's my motion. So we have a motion by Ms. Derrick and a second by Mr. Ramos. All those in favor? That is unanimous. So, Dr. Chapman, what are we looking for next? Would Mr. Chapman like to take a um, shot? <laughs> make a motion that we approve the administrator contracts <coughs> for Vivian Field and Newman Smith. Mm -hmm. We have a motion by Mr. Shackman. Do we have a second? Yes, okay, we have a second by Mr. Matthews. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of approving the contracts for Vivian Field and Newman Smith, please raise your hands. And then um, that let the record show that both Ms. Derrick and Mr. Ramos recuse themselves on this item. So we need a motion to approve Ranch View. Now, Ms. Klein, I would make a motion that we approve the administrator contracts for Ranch View and Landry. We have a motion by Mr. Shackman. Second that. We have a second by Mr. Ramos. All those in favor? And so we have, it is unanimous. Um, all those in favor, except for Ms. Herbacek, who is recusing herself. So we are done with items removed from consent agenda, which takes us to item 6B. Consider approval of order to cancel election. Dr. Warnock or no. Ms. Tillman. Yes. Thank you. The deadline to file for a place on the ballot for the May 4th, 2019 trustee election was February 15th and the write-in deadline was February 19th. The only candidates to file for a place on the ballot were the three incumbents, Guillermo William Ramos, Tara Herbacek, and Randy Shackman. You have received the certification of unopposed candidates from district administration responsible for preparing the ballot. Therefore, you may cancel the election to be held on May 4th, 2019 by accepting the certification of unopposed candidates adopting an order declaring the election canceled and the unopposed candidates elected. Um, please note that we can't issue the certifications until after the election date has passed as well as the canvassing period has passed. And that's when we can officially issue the certificates, swear you in and take on your duties for the next term. Um, the order reads as follow. The Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District hereby cancels the election scheduled to be held on May 4th, 2019 in accordance with section 2.053A of the Texas Election Code. The following candidates have been certified as unopposed and are hereby elected as follows. Tara Herbacek, Board of Trustee, Guillermo Ramos, Board of Trustee, Randy Shackman, Board of Trustee. A copy of this order will be posted on election day at each polling place that would have been used in the election. So this evening we are asking the board of trustees to accept the certification of unopposed candidates, adopt the order canceling the May 4th, 2019 election and declare the unopposed candidates elected. I'd like to go ahead and make the motion. Okay, Ms. Derrick. I move that the board accept the certification of unopposed candidates, adopt the order declaring that the May 4th, 2019 election be canceled and the unopposed candidates elected. We have a motion by Ms. Derrick. Second by Ms. Valenzuela. Um, Ms. Tillman, how much money are we saving by not having this election about? 35 to 40,000 minimum. That's good. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Anybody want to go ahead and have the election? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Well, you want it to fail? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, that appears to be unanimous. So, um, so that is item 6B. Item 6C, moving on, is consider the approval of purchase of classroom libraries for elementary and middle school classrooms. Ms. Dr. Warnock. Thank you, Ms. Klein and members of the board. 
Um, we are uh, requesting that the board approve uh, tonight the purchase of classroom libraries, not to exceed the amount of $125,000. We um, have Title I funds that come to us from the federal government. We get an amount that's sent to us in June, and that's what we plan. Uh, plan to use with our campuses and that money's distributed on a per pupil basis out to campuses and then at the end of November we received additional funds from the federal government in the amount of about hundred and sixty thousand dollars so um, every year we plan to roll forward about 10 to 15 percent of that to uh, carry over into the next year but doing that of rolling forward 10 to 15 percent still leaves us with some funds that are required to be spent in this school year to help children this year so um, we always um, are increasing our classroom libraries to provide uh, additional book selections for students this will assist with uh, the transitions in our bilingual program that we have talked to you about will benefit students this school year and continuing into next year um, we're able to buy uh, high interest on level and um, also leveled books for struggling readers as part of this classroom library selection so we would ask you uh, to approve that thank you dr. Warnock sure. board members mr. Bacic I move um, that we approve the purchase of classroom libraries at a total cost not to exceed $125,000 as described. Thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Bacic. We have a second by Mr. Matthews. Is there any discussion? Okay. Um, the con do the teachers pick the books or do y'all look at it district wide and, and like all fourth grade gets the same titles or, or how does that work? Yeah, we're purchasing um, classroom library sets that are aligned with our curriculum okay. adoption. So um, those were selected by the content directors and are curated collections that align with our curriculum. All those with no more discussion, we'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor of the classroom library purchase? That is unanimous. Um, 6D, item 6D is consider the approval of purchase of network switch equipment for eight campuses. Yes, at this time, Ms. Webb's gonna come up and discuss that a little further. She, she spoke you know, at a pre-meeting about uh, consent items H and I and, and then the difference uh, with a uh, consent item D. So, Ms. Webb. Okay. As I share with you this evening, <clears throat> I invite you to consider this question. What is older than an Apple Watch, older than an iPad, and older than the vast majority of the students in CFB ISD? There will be a test at the end. The core principles that guide decisions around technology are mobility, access, and security to support any time any place any place any pace learning with a focus on these core principles requires a strong stable foundation to ensure high efficiency for uninterrupted learning and operations continuity requires a strong stable foundation I'm giving you clues as and as CFBISD moves forward with innovative programming and future technologies, a strong, stable foundation is necessary, one, to provide resources for teachers to become orchestrators and facilitators of learning, and two, to consider how education is delivered to motivate learners and to prepare them for their futures. A robust digital environment is built on a foundation that is not highly visible. It is a foundation comprised of machines with blinky lights behind locked doors with cables and ceilings, walls, and under the floors. Are you catching on yet? With the passage of the TRE in 2016 and the board's acknowledgement of the importance of technology, the network infrastructures for all CFB campuses have been upgraded with the exception of the eight remaining campuses listed on the agenda. The network gear for these, camp these campuses have reached the end of useful life as they have been in service for 15 years or more. So I just gave you the answer to the question. 
Network gear at these eight campuses is older than the Apple Watch, which came to being in 2015, older than the iPad, which came into being in 2010, and older than 75% of our students. Wow. Outdated equipment can become a serious risk to create the conditions and capacities more, most conducive for students, teachers, and leaders to perform at high levels and meet expectations of CFBISD learning standards, it is time to upgrade the network infrastructures of these campuses. So tonight, we seek the board's approval for the purchase of network equipment to upgrade these eight remaining campuses. Thank you. Board members? We have any? Yes, Ms. Valenzuela. I move that we approve the purchase and installation of network switching equipment for the eight campuses identified with a recommended vendor as described. Thank you. We have a motion by Ms. Valenzuela. We have a second by Mr. Ramos. Is there any discussion? I would ask how long does this take? It takes about um, seven or eight hours per campus. We do it usually at night. Are there any other questions? Uh, on, by current standards, how often should this be repeated? The industry standard is somewhere between seven and 10 years. 15 and to 17 years is way outside the boundaries. And that's imagine. where we are right now. Yes. So it appears we have no more discussion. I was gonna say, does anybody wanna say what the switch looks like? No, <laughs> so, but um, just how large is the gear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were given the earlier answers. So um, all those in favor of agenda item 60? That was unanimous. So um, that brings us to item number seven. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Closed meeting is authorized under Texas government code, including but not limited to section 551.071. Consultation with attorney 551.072 rural property, 551.074 personnel matters, 551.076 security devices, 551.082 school children, district employees disciplinary matter or complaint, 551.0821 personally identifiable student information, 551.084 investigation. 7A, pursuant to section 551.074 Texas Government Code deliberations regarding the employment evaluation, reassignment duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee, including investigation of a complaint concerning a public officer. 7B, pursuant to section 551.071 Texas Government Code consultation with district's legal counsel regarding legal and procedural issues relating to personnel matters, including investigation of complaint concerning a public officer. Audience members are welcome to remain in the boardroom as board members recess and move into room 150, the executive conference room for deliberations. The time is now 8.34 p.m. This meeting is recessed. We will reconvene this meeting at 11.47 p.m. An open meeting for possible action regarding items discussed in closed meeting. Um, board members item 8a is consider and take possible action on complaint concerning a public officer is there any action to be taken i move that the board authorize the board president to work with legal counsel to document action to be taken in response to the complaint in accordance with the discussion in uh, the discussion in closed session we have a motion by candace valenzuela is there a second We have a second by Sally Derrick. All those in, is there any, all those in favor? That is unanimous. Um, so with that, comments, item number nine is comments from board members regarding posted agenda items. Um, hearing none, seeing none, it appears we've reached the end of our agenda at 11.48 p.m. This meeting is adjourned.